Let's all stand as we worship today. Every mind, 
Church. My name is Andrew Floyd. I'm the student pastor here, and we're glad you're here with us this morning. We've had a great week at VBS, even though Pastor Dan and Pastor Justin didn't let me get on stage and have a microphone once. I'm not bitter about that. Everybody up. 
Oh, it doesn't work in here. Oh, I always wanted to try that, but I guess it doesn't work for me. So, um, but we're glad you're here this morning. We've had a great week of VBS and we are glad you're here. If you wouldn't mind checking in for us by texting uh, the word info to 386-400-9991 or just scanning the QR code there on the back of that pew in front of you, it'll take you to our info page where you can see what's going on this week in the life of our church. You can check in, you can see what's uh, gonna be going on for the next couple of weeks and a lot of great information that's there for you. Um, so we would love for you to check that out there. There's gonna be sermon notes there so you can follow along with Pastor Dan preaches in just a few moments. But let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Bow your heads with me. Dear Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to just uh, to gather in your house, Lord, to sing praises to your name. Lord, the name of Jesus it is a powerful name. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you today. And Lord, as the word is proclaimed in just a few moments, Lord, we pray that you would allow us to um, soften our hearts so that you can change who we are. Lord, that your spirit would just continue to move in our lives and we would just continue to follow after you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.
good morning. What a great week it's been as we have uh, had an opportunity to be in Vacation Bible School, and it has been uh, just, just a lot of fun. And uh, love love this week, and uh, just so grateful for the opportunity to uh, impact our community in the way that we do. Um, today we're going to begin a brand new sermon series called For the Home, and we're going to be talking about uh, the reality that we live out our faith probably most importantly within the confines of our home. Now, let's be sure that we understand what our home is, because our home is, is yes, it is the, the place that we call home, our family, our, our kids, our grandkids, our uh, spouse. That, that is definitely our home. But for some people, the home can also be uh, friend groups. It can also be social organizations. It can be, it can be those people that know you best. So just think about that for a second. And let's make sure that we apply this, not just within the four walls of our address, but we think about the reality that we uh, can call home a lot of different things. And so uh, what we understand is that um, the home is, is really kind of like a lab. Does anybody remember taking chemistry when you were in high school or college? I remember taking chemistry in high school. I didn't take it in college, and I was grateful for that. But I remember in, in high school, we would uh, sit and we would talk about all of these different uh, chemical compositions that you could put together. You could put this chemical with this chemical, and you could mix, or you could, uh, you could make a solution. And, and through, uh, through textbook ways, you could add up certain parts of the different elements, and you could determine whether or not it was going to be acidic or base. You could determine whether or not it was going to be stable or unstable. You could determine whether or not it was just going to explode in your face or, or just kind of sit there in a, in, a, in a beaker or whatever. I remember having all of those conversations and we would sit down and we would do all the calculations. We would do all the equations and we knew if we put this with this with this, then it would all kind of come out to be this. And, and then he would say, now let's go over to the lab and mix it up. And see, Before, when we were just doing it on paper, it was fine. But we're about to do it in real life. See, I, 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 was, I was solid. This is, this is a, a safe composition. I can put all of these chemicals together. But when the moment comes that you've got to actually dump that into the beaker and see what happens, see if you were correct, I remember I would watch, my, my, my chemistry teacher was Mr. Nippers, and I would always watch his feet because he would be sitting there and he'd say, okay, now pour the next one in. And if he ever went like this, you knew that something was about to happen. <laughs> you know, because he could see and he knew what kind of what all was about, to, was about to go together. And he knew if we were right or if we were wrong. And obviously he would never put us in danger. But if he ever took that step back, then you were like, oh, I don't know what I'm about to do. But let's go for it. See, a lot of times we act like our home is the classroom. We know all the right stuff. We do all the right calculations. We, we've got all the right answers. But you see, the home is not a classroom. The home is a lab. And it, it, it's where all of our knowledge gets put, in, put into practice. And we have an opportunity in the laboratory of the home to test our faith, to test our beliefs, to test our foundation, to test our, our structure, to test who we are, there's a great test. And honestly, when you look at the home today, there's a lot of homes that are failing that test, aren't there? It's difficult. And so uh, you might remember that at the beginning of last year, and I know that January of 2020 is like, uh, like five years ago, but January 2020, we said that we wanted to be known as a church we wanted to be known more for what we're for than for what we're against. And so we said that we're, we're going to be for the land. We're going to be for our city. We're going to be for our community. We said we're going to be for schools. We've demonstrated that in the way that we serve uh, schools in, in our community. We said that we're going to be for missions. We, we send people on mission. and We have been given away in missions. We have served in our community on mission. We said we're going to be four kids. We saw that this week at Vacation Bible School. Four students in the way that we resource that ministry. And just a couple of weeks ago, going uh, on youth camp. Four families. We want families to succeed and to be vibrant and to grow within the, the classroom of the church and the lab of the home. And today, we want to just simply proclaim to you and demonstrate for you that we are for the home. Over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about that. We're going to give you some ideas, and, and honestly, we're going to put our we're going to put 
feet to our words. So over the next several weeks, what you're going to see is not only a sermon series, but you're also going to see some resources show up on our, on our campus that we hope will be helpful to you in being the home that God has called you to be, and to being the mom and the dad, the grandparents, the husband, the wife, the kids that God has called you to be. He has given us some real great instruction, and we, we're looking forward to being able to share that with you. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me today, kind of as a, as a point of introduction, turn with me today to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, you can find the scripture uh, also on that link that was sent to you earlier. You can click on sermon notes and you can follow along in our YouVersion Bible app or you can uh, watch on the screen behind me. Um, before we get there though, I want to I just kind of give you a quick introduction about Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible. It's also the last book of what is called the Torah. Deuteronomy is written to a group of people that are about to go in and take the promised land, the, the land that God had promised to Jacob and Isaac and, and Joseph, uh, this land that, that had been promised to the Israelite nation for a long time. He, they're about to go in and take it. Now, the reason that it's important to know that is that there's a whole generation of people that had an opportunity to go into the promised land, but by a vote chose not to. They said, no, we can't do that. We know that's what God's calling us to do, but we can't do that. So God said, fine, if you can't do that, you won't do that. And by the way, you'll walk, wander around in the wilderness for 40 years and you'll all die. That's a great piece of information. And so all of that generation that was able to go into the promised land the first time They've all died other than two people. They've all died. And so this second generation, their children are about to go in and, and, and do what their parents should have done. And Moses gathers them up because he doesn't want them to go into the promised land uninformed. Instead, he wants them to know what they're up to against, what their parents did, what their grandparents did. He wants to give them the story. And so the book of Deuteronomy is really a set of speeches and laws that are given to this second generation of Israelites that are then going to go into the promised land. And so when you think about it that way, the information and the speeches, the sermons, if you will, that Moses gives are, are, are really impactful and help us to understand a little bit more about the context of the situation. So uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. We're going to focus on verses 4 through 9, but I want to read you a little bit of context just so you can hear kind of his whole message. He says, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you were going over to possess it. See, he's talking to that second generation. That you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you. And that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, our key passage here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build and houses full of good things that you did not fill and cisterns that you did not dig and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. In other words, you're about to inherit a lot of things that you didn't do anything for. When that time comes and when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve. And by his name, you shall swear. You see, Moses realized and God realized that in this land that they were going, while it was filled with great cities and great people, it was also filled with pagan worship, idol worship, other gods, little g. It was filled with, with ways that the Israelites could turn from the God of their fathers and the real God, Yahweh, 
And they could turn to Baal worship and they could turn to uh, all of these other uh, idols and gods that the people of Canaan tended to worship. So Moses is coming before these people and saying, just be careful, be aware. And he, and he, and he gives these, uh, a couple of really strong commands. First of all, he uses the word hear. Uh, in, in, the Israel, in the Hebrew language, that would be the word shema. Shema does not just mean to hear with your ears. Shema means to hear, uh, hear, about, hear what is said uh, and to respond to what is said. It's not just to hear, it is to hear and respond. A, a way that we would say that is not hear, we would say obey. Hear it and respond to it. You know, it's kind of like talking to your kids and they go, I hear you, mom. You're like, that's not enough. I don't want you to hear me. I want you to do what I'm saying, right? Hear is not enough. Obey is what we're looking for. And then he says that the the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. You remember, have you heard that anywhere else? I think Jesus said that over in in the New Testament when he said the first and greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. He says, you know, the way we say it around is you need to love God and love people. Love God and love people. And, and, but, but see, that love is, is not just like an emotion, like we think of love, but it's an emotion with action. It, it's really not just love as an emotion. It's love meaning I'm devoted, I'm committed it's, it's I, I love my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. I'm committed to him with everything that I am. Uh, it's love with, 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 with decision and emotion with decision. And Moses then, you know, here, okay, obey. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he pushes this instruction to an, an, a kind of an interesting place. Listen to it. He, he, he doesn't push it to the temple. He doesn't push it to the church. He doesn't push it to the courts. He doesn't push this instruction to the classroom. He doesn't say you need to teach this in the public square. No, he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this truth, this commandment, shall be taught in the home. It's the place of instruction. It's the lab. It's the place where faith grows most. It's the place where where life happens. It's the place where faith is not just um, heard, but it's seen and it's demonstrated. It's within the home. It's the place of commitment and instruction. Uh, what, what I'm telling you is that if we lose the home, we lose the battle. That is the battleground. It is the place. And we have to focus on it. So today, just by way of introduction, I want to walk through this passage just real quickly. I want to give you three quick principles that I think really speak to this, this reality Three principles. If you're taking notes, I would encourage you to write these things down. They're things that will kind of guide us throughout the rest of the series. So the first thing that that Moses really presents is he presents what what we're going to call the priority principle. The priority principle. I'm going to give it to you. It's going to be a lot of words. You might take a minute. It'll stay there on the screen for a few minutes. But the priority principle is, is, is this. It is that the displayed priorities of this generation will be accentuated by the next generation. Please hear this. And there's a lot of words there, but I, I want you to really focus in on one, and it is the word displayed. Because you see, it's not what you say is important, it's what you show is important. I, I think it was John Maxwell that said, um, your walk talks and your talk talks, but sometimes your walk talks so loudly that nobody can hear what your talk is talking. Let me say that one more time. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but sometimes your walk talks so loudly that nobody can hear what your talk is talking. 
You can say whatever you want to say, but people will see what you say is important. People will see what you believe is important. Your displayed priorities will be accentuated by the next generation. We've seen this over and over and over again, and we see it in Scripture. You see, this group of people that Moses is speaking to, they did really well at first. They consecrated themselves. They went over the Jordan River. They took Jericho by following God's instruction. You remember that crazy instruction where they were supposed to march around once a day for seven days, and on the seventh day they were supposed to march around for seven days. Then they were supposed to shout, and then this, the walls of this great city were just going to fall. And anybody in their right mind would have said, that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard in my life. But it wasn't because it was God's instruction. And so they followed God in that. But then they started struggling because they stopped listening to God. They thought, wow, we are really powerful. Let's go do that again. We don't really need a whole army. Let's go take Ai. That's the next city down. And they got their tails whipped. And it was a bad situation because you see, they forgot the Lord and they started trusting in themselves. And then they forgot the Lord and they started trusting in other gods. And it gets all the way, what you find is that generations and generations and generations pass and what you find is you can go back all the way to the end of the book of Judges and you'll find this verse. In Judges 21, 25, it says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Basically, it became the Wild West. Nobody cares anymore. Just do what you think is right, and everybody should just accept what you think is right. Everybody is their own God. Everybody is their own ruler. You make the rules for your life. You make the rules for your life. There are no overarching rules. I tell you what, that is a crazy culture, isn't it? Isn't it? Does it sound familiar? In some ways, have we not come right back to that very moment? Man, what a crazy situation. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You know where that started? Priorities. You see, they said that God was one, but then they started believing in themselves. God is one, but really it's about us winning. God is one, it's really about us expanding. God is number one, but look at that other God over there. You see, it's about your displayed priority. So question for you, what is your displayed priority? You see, in our homes, we can display a lot of priorities. We can display the priority of grades. Make the grade. Display the priority of sports. Be on the first team. Be a starter Display the, uh, the, the, the priority of popularity, fitness, do well, advancement, politics, just make sure you vote right, entertainment, wealth, make lots of money, status, climb that ladder. What is the displayed priority in your family? Because it'll make a difference. Second principle. That is the parenting principle. And I know that I'm looking at a lot of people that are parents and some that are grandparents, some that aren't parents yet. Please, if you're not parents yet, just write this down and remember it one day. If you're grandparents, you can focus on your kids or maybe even on your grandkids. But here's the principle. The primary job of parenting is to lead our children to Jesus. You see... <laughs> Parenting is an interesting situation, isn't it? I remember that moment where, uh, you know, we were in the hospital in Natchez, Mississippi, and we had our first child, and then it came time to go home. And they were just like, okay, you're going home. We we're like, yay, what? How, how, so, like, is there, like, somebody who comes home with us and teaches us stuff? Like, shows us how to do things? We were clueless. Well, I was. She had it all figured out. I was clueless. And honestly, I think I still am. And by the way, I said this, this in the 830 service when he was sitting right there. I've never been the parent of a 14-year-old before. Hey, all of you down here, your parents have never been parents of you before. 
By the way, that's true of everybody in the room. You've never been where you are today. I've never parented a 14-year-old. And now I have a second one coming up. He's 10. In four years, he'll be 14. And you might say, well, you've been the parent of a 14-year-old. Yeah, but I've never been the parent of a 14-year-old and an 18-year-old. See, we're all just along for the ride. It's a tough gig, isn't it? You can read all the books you want to read. You know what? Those people didn't have your kids. You can do everything you want to do to try to figure it out. There is nobody that can actually tell you how to fully raise your kids. They just can't. But I do want to share with you, the most important thing that you can do as a parent is to lead your kid to Jesus. Because you see, that's true of all of us. That is universal. We all need Jesus in our life. So let me ask you a really tough question. It kind of goes back to that priority principle. What if your kid is an abysmal failure but knows Jesus? You okay? That's a tough one, isn't it? What if your grandkids, just by every world standard, just but you know that they know Jesus as their Savior. Mm, just got real, didn't it? That's tough. Now, I, 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 please hear me. I'm not saying that it's either or. I think that we can, I think that we can go down both rails. I think that, but let's make sure that we keep important and primary what's important and primary. I want you to ask yourself, what is your goal in parenting? What's number one for you? Because you see, Psalm 145 verse 4 says this, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. That should be our goal. i got to move on. Because this last one is the permanence principle. The permanence principle. Moses says it this way. He says, uh, you shall teach these things to your children when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They literally had leather boxes that they would, that they would tie on their hands to remind them of the, of the laws of Israel. You shall uh, have them as frontlets between your eyes. They would have a little box that, uh, that, they would, that they would tie around their head and it would be this little box right in, in between their eyes so that they would never forget they would write them on the doorposts of their house, on their gates. If you were to go to a Jewish person's house, you would probably see a little box on the door frame of their house, and, and inside it would be a little scroll, and inside the scroll would probably be written in Hebrew, the Ten Commandments. It, would, it, it, it reminds us over and over and over of what, has, what does God require of us. Here's the thing that we need to understand in our lives, and I'm not asking you to tie a leather box around your head or to write this on your door frame, but oh my goodness, how about we start emphasizing what we want to be emphasized because the principle is what is consistently emphasized in our homes and in our lives will be reinforced over and over and over and over again. Listen, friends, we cannot hide in our home. We cannot hide in our home. My kids know me better than you do. They know me. They know when I mess up. They know when I'm doing it right. Listen, they know me. And your kids know you. You might be able to hide it when you're here, but not when you're at home. Because you are constantly emphasizing something. What are those daily reminders, daily routines, daily disciplines that your kids, your grandkids, your husband, your wife, what are those things that they are seeing in your life? Because you see those things, you're emphasizing them regularly, and they will be reinforced over and over again. And you'll find that many of those practices will be picked up by those in your household. The permanence principle. So what is it that's being reinforced in your home? Over the next several weeks, we're going to talk a lot more about this. 
But can I just say right now, as we come to this moment, as we look at the culture that we live in today, as we look at the world that we live in today, the home as a concept, man, it's in trouble. Man, there are homes that are disintegrating inside and outside the church. Being inside the church really bears no, no meaning in this because some of the struggles that are going on outside the church are going on inside the church. Marriages are ending in divorce. Parenting's such a struggle. Kids are going their own way. So many influences. So much lack of love and respect. So many frustrations. So many relationship issues. You know, I look at a room like this and I realize that some of you even today may have realized that your behavior and the demonstration of your behavior is leading your home down a bad path. Maybe there's a level of conviction even here in this room today. Some of you are looking at your kids and you're thinking, man, I just wish they'd come back. I just wish I had another chance. Some of you are dealing with a prodigal child that you don't even know where they are, and this hurts. Some of you are, 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 are sitting here today and you're thinking, man, I just, I, I need to have some conversations in my home and I, just, I literally don't know how. I don't know how to bring up the topic. Some of you are hurting. When we start talking about the home, some of you are like, okay, great, I made it to week one, I'm out for the next three weeks because I don't want to hear any more of this because it hurts too bad. Can I just tell you? First of all, I believe in the power of prayer. I believe that one of the greatest things that we can do to reform our homes is to hit our knees and say, Lord, first of all, change me and then change the circumstances. Lord, start with me, work on my heart. I'm laying myself bare before you. I realize I'm not perfect because none of us are. Remember, there's no guidebook. We just do our best. But Lord, change me, work on me. And then would you work in these circumstances because I don't know what to do. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. It can happen. So I want to just take just a couple of minutes today and give you an opportunity to respond. I know we're short on time, but let's not, let's not miss what God might be doing right here as we have this time together. We're going to have a time where Carl is going to lead us in a song. I'm going to be down here at the front. And these steps, we're just going to turn into an altar. And I can't think of any better thing for you to do to maybe recapture that home than that for us to get on our knees together and for us to simply cry out to the Lord and ask him to work in ways that we can't. Would you do that? Let me pray for us, and then we'll have that time of response. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for loving us the way you do. Lord, would you have your way in us, accomplish your purpose, let us rest in you. God, this is your time. Would you have your way as we respond? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we respond, would you stand? And let's take just a moment. Remember, here you can pray. Whatever God's calling you to do, this is your time. Would you come? I was a Outside the city, none would come close, but you wouldn't let go. What worked back then will work again, because I know the blood is still the blood. I had a issue. No one could help. I tried them all. The last try I crawled. And what worked back then will work again. I know the blood is still the blood. And oh, how precious. How beautiful this priceless love 
I've come to know And in the midst of my darkest storm I know the blood is still the blood Well, once again, thank you for joining us today at Stetson Baptist Church online. We were so grateful that you had an opportunity to join with us in this way. I know that for many of you that are watching, maybe you're out of town, maybe you're on the road, or maybe you're in your home. And for a lot of you, you would love to be here in person. I, I, would, I want you to know that we would love for you to come. We'd love for you to be a part of what God's doing as we gather together. But in the meantime, we are so thankful that we have this way that we can gather together in a virtual streaming way. I'm grateful that you were a part of today's service. A couple of quick things before we leave. First of all, we would love for you to check into this service if you haven't done so already by texting the word CHECK to 386 400 9991. Also, we would love to uh, let you know about the things that are coming up and the things that are ongoing in our church by texting the word INFO to 386-400-9991. On there is also a digital connect card in our digital bulletin. And then finally, if you text the word GIVE to 386-400-9991, we would love for you to have access so that you can give online. Other ways that you can give to our church is uh, you can use your bank's bill pay system or you can drop a, uh, a, a, an offering by the church office any day this week. We are so thankful that you were here today. I pray that you will take the words that we have shared and the message that we've shared and that the impact of that message will be life-changing for you and it will be something that you'll be able to apply to your life every day this week. Also, please know in this time as we are continuing to work through this process, we love you, we care about you. And if there's any way that our church can serve you and your family, we would love to. Just give us a call. 386-734-1991. That's a different phone number. Or you can uh, actually email us at, it goes to all of our pastors, info at stetson.church. That's distributed to all of our pastors. So we would love to get in touch with you in that way. Know that we care about you. Know that we love you. It's the summertime. We've got a lot of things going on. We just are so appreciative of your prayers and we're very much looking toward the fall where ministry is gonna kick off full steam. We look forward to what God is doing in your life and we can't wait to see you again. God bless you. Thanks for being a part of this service. We hope to see you again next week.